please welcome to the stage our last speaker, Sean Thompson. Well, I've got to tell you how wonderful it is to be here. I'm from uh, Santa Barbara in California, but some of you might recognize a South African accent. Uh, that's uh, where I was born. So I'd particularly like to thank um, RSM for bringing me out here. To Steve, thank you. And I'd like to thank all the alumni for coming, especially uh, some of the students, and especially the superwoman that's sitting right here, <coughs> Michaela Skippers. Michaela and I connected about uh, eight months ago, and I was doing some research on goal setting, and I linked up with a site called ResearchGate. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this site, but, uh, but I, can, I can give you a great recommendation for ResearchGate. It's a wonderful way to just connect people with uh, similar interests together. And I came across what uh, Michaela, or Michaela, I don't know how to pronounce it correctly, even though I know you now, uh, had done on goal setting. And how she had, uh, through statistical analysis, had shown the great impact that goal setting has on young people using uh, very defined uh, performance uh, parameters. And we connected, and we corresponded, and uh, she uh, said, well, why don't you come out and speak at our conference? Hence, um, I'm here. So there's a couple of things I want to do today. And one of them is uh, there's been a lot of, of talk about purpose, what exactly it is. And I wanted to show all of you and give you a simple tool that you can perhaps use and perhaps help you to refine, define, and find um, your purpose. So I wanted to read you something that I wrote last night. Generally, I, I, I don't read in my presentation, but I know there's some brainy dudes here and brainy women. So I just thought I wanted to clarify my thoughts uh, in writing before I start telling you stories. So my personal mission is to build a powerful wave of purpose throughout organizations to activate positive change. This is what I've been doing for 20 years now. The desired result is high levels of engagement, well-being, and improved performance. My approach is simple. I tell stories, and I illustrate a simple, quick, and low-cost intervention to activate purpose in organizations. And when you hear my method, when you hear my code, it's open source code. So any of you can take this away and use it, and you will see how my code is so closely aligned to what you're doing at RSM. In fact, you will be amazed at the connectivity. So I tell stories across the world to community groups, to religious groups, to associations, to high schools, university, and to some of the world's greatest companies. I tell simple stories of passion and purpose. I tell stories of character, of ethos. I tell stories and I describe how to create a simple code to activate purpose. Telos, that wonderful Greek word. I offer no prescription. Only my stories and my perspective of ethos, character, and telos purpose. And I offer my code to help others find their purpose and find their power. After my stories are told, I encourage others to write their own code. 12 lines of commitment, 12 lines of purpose and power, melding their ethos and melding their tethos, telos, their purpose, into a commitment to action. These 12 lines of code are written within 30 minutes in a group setting, each line beginning with the words, I will, and then read out loud to the group. This process, the code method, is a tool for individual introspection, collective engagement, commitment, and accountability that seems to help distill and reframe one's purpose and focus one's psychic energy into an actionable 12-line mantra for positive change. It is a way to find one's best self and a way for others to know one's best self. I believe this simple intervention can help individuals and organizations find meaning and purpose in the challenging sea of life. And today, I'm excited to share my code. There are only two ways that each and every one of us have become transformed by purpose. We find purpose or purpose finds us. These stories are about how purpose found me. I live now in Santa Barbara in California, and I live 12.1 miles away from one of the greatest waves in the world, a place called Rincon. All those little dots you see out there 
of surfers, not seals. When a surfer's got a drink on, you can catch a wave right up at the top of the point there and ride for almost a mile. It's a truly inspirational and exhilarating experience. I moved to the United States in 1995. I was hired by one of the companies that's a world leader in sustainability, a company called Patagonia. Yvonne Chenard hired me, brought my entire family out, and for two years, I worked for Yvonne at Patagonia, running one of their biggest divisions, the apparel division. After I left Patagonia, my wife and I started our own company called Solitude. And while I started my company, we set up our offices right across the road from this wonderful break. And shortly after I'd gotten my company going, I got a call from a pal of mine. He said, Sean, Rincon is facing a severe environmental challenge. All the homeowners of those multi-million dollar homes that live along the point are connected to septic tank systems. People pull the chain, the poo goes in the septic tank. When it rains, they over, it overflows, and it overflows into that river that bisects the break. You can see in the northern part of the picture, the effluent flows out in the, into the ocean. You can see the brown sludge, and surfers get sick. He said, I want you to help me do something to solve this particular problem. So at the time, I had my business, and I thought, well, what can I do to help you? Is he asking me for a contribution, for a financial contribution? to solve the severe environmental problem of one of the greatest waves in the world. He said, Sean, I'm not looking for money. In fact, I'm going to give you money. I have a $100 budget, and this is what we're going to do to solve the problem. I'm going to bring 100 students down to the beach. We're going to bring the media down to the beach. We're going to bring the city council down to the beach. We're going to bring some government officials down to the beach, and we are going to highlight this problem. He said, I want you to give something to the young children that are coming down to the beach within that $100 budget. He said, I want you to give them something inspirational. I want you to give them something that's going to make them aware of this issue and be able to tell the media and the government that this is a serious uh, issue. So at the time, I had my company, Solitude, that I founded with my wife. We made super cool shirts. We had amazing, amazing product. I thought, well, maybe I'll like, go into the warehouse and pull some inventory for these kids. And, and then I thought, no, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do something different. And you know what I did next ultimately changed my life and took me down a different path. I went home that night and thought and thought, and I pulled out a sheet of paper, and I did this. I wrote 12 lines. Every line stays beginning with, I will. And I called it Surface Code. And I wrote this code in 30 minutes. I don't know why it came out at 12. I don't know why I started it with, I will. It just happened that way. And I entitled it Surface Code. And every single line there is a metaphor for life. And it can be unpeeled like an onion and read in many different ways. It's about perseverance, about courage, about honor, about integrity. But every, sign, every line begins with, I will. Every line begins with those two words of power. So I gave 100 cards that I printed up within the $100 budget, and I gave them to the young children that came down to the beach about a week later with the media. So how can 100 cards change a life? So the kids really like the cards. Wow, these cards are awesome. The media really like the cards. Wow, these cards are awesome. It's about honor and about integrity. It's about a code. We got a lot of media publicity around it. And ultimately, we went on and we resolved and solved this severe environmental problem. It cost a few million bucks. We got the homeowners to chip in. But ultimately, we solved the problem. But the code kept rolling. I started printing more cards because I got demands from the more children, more parents, and I started printing thousands and thousands and thousands of cards. Ultimately, we put the cards in our clothing. We were printing, making a lot of clothing back then, so hundreds of thousands of these cards of honor and integrity and power and commitment started diffusing throughout the community. Until eventually, people would phone me up and they'd say, Sean, why don't you come and talk at our organization? Why don't you come and talk at our synagogue? Why don't you come and talk at our shul? Why don't you come and talk at our leadership conference? Why don't you come and talk at our company about the simple precepts and power inside a code? So at one of the conferences, I met up with a guy. He came up, to, came up to me after the conference. He was an academic. He was a professor of French literature. He said, Sean, I think this would make a terrific book. 12 lines, 12 chapters. I said, well, I've never written a book. He said, well, I've never written a book either, but I'm a professor of French literature. I know a lot about literature. So over a summer, we collaborated and I released my first book, and I called it Surface Code. And each chapter was an exploration of every single one of those lines of code that I'd written and passed on to the children. 
So a few years ago, I was sitting out in the lineup, bobbing around in the lineup, and a guy paddles up to me. He says, Sean, I'm a headmaster of a local school right here in Santa Barbara. We have 80 students. It's a tiny school. But we would love to come, have you come, and talk to us about a code. So I go down to the school, and I take my book down to the school, and the media comes down and covers it. See my book up there, me standing in front of the students. And while I'm talking to the students, I have an epiphany. I say, surface code's my code. I wrote it in 30 minutes, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. 105 year words. What about your code? What about your power? What about your passion? What about your path? Write your code for me. Write it in, write it in 30 minutes, 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. So as an assignment, the headmaster said, students, write your code. So a week later, I get back the codes. 80 students, 12 lines each, nearly 1,000 lines of code. And the very first line of code I get back from Elena El Cerro, 13 years old, I will always be myself. I will always be myself. Power. For any of you that are parents, you know the incredible challenges that our children are faced with every day. That was a flag ah, in the sand. I will be myself. And it touched me at a deep, deep, deep emotional level. I cried when I read those words, I will be myself. I lost my son, 15 and a half years old, to a bad decision about six months before. And this touched me at a visceral level. And I thought, wow, look at all these lines of code that these young people have written. It's so inspirational. It needs to be part of a wave that can move around the world. I will do what I say I will do. I will not compromise on my morals to fit in with each other. So I thought I'm gonna write another book. And I wrote another book, Patrick and I got together over a summer, and every single line is written of that chapter title by a student, not by me. I just went out there and did a selection process and got those from the students. With of course, the first line being, I will be myself. So the book got popular, lots of students started reading it, a lot of students started writing their codes, and headmasters would phone me up and say, why don't you come and talk at our school? I went to one school in Florida, and instead of writing their code, they created these amazing inspirational graphics. They created a whole art exhibition inside their auditorium, inspiring the entire school with these wonderful words that these young people wrote. I will electrify. I will tell my own story. I will follow my own path. Kids in South Africa writing their codes, I will be different. I will be drug-free. I will focus on my future. I will be a positive vibe. Beautiful emotional statements of purpose. Kids defining their purpose really simply. So I could see that this program was getting resonance, but I needed to learn more about it. So I went back to grad school a few years ago. I think I was the oldest student in grad school studying leadership. I think I was older than the oldest lecturers. But I was fascinated by the study. How can you influence and inspire people towards a collective goal? How can you influence and inspire others? How can you create a positive wave? And I'd seen it. I'd seen something with these young people. So I came across this interesting study by this wonderful professor at Duke that one million Americans die every year from poor choice, from purposelessness. The single biggest killer in the United States, one million out of 2.4 million people die from poor choice. I came across this other interesting study, the ripple effect, how you can drop a stone, create a ripple, build a wave. Through emotional contagion, you can fundamentally impact others in groups. I came across this other study. Now, this study was significant. 689,000 people were studied without their knowledge with Facebook and the National Academy of Sciences, and they prove that emotional contagion can be transmitted virally. Every single one of us, by what we write, by what we say, we can impact others at a deeply emotional level without them knowing. So I'm going, wow, what potency there is in words. Is it possible to drop a stone, start a ripple, and build a wave that carries itself right around the entire world? So I know most of you here in the audience are scientists. I know there's a lot of entrepreneurs as well. But I embarked on a project. Is it possible to create a positive wave across a nation? Is it possible 
to get kids inspiring each other with words of purpose. And these are the words. I will. Because power. I will. Equals power. So I hooked up with the biggest insurance company in South Africa, Liberty Group, with one of the biggest book publishers, and I said, let's do a positive wave tour. And I'll go out there and speak to the poorest and the poshest schools in the country and attempt to create a positive wave and inspire kids to write their codes and create a positive wave of purpose. This year I did the same tour. I did one tour last year. I did another tour this year. We did thousands and thousands of kids, and we got them to write their codes. 35 schools, 60,000 students, printed hundreds of thousands of these little badges. I will. And I would tell the kids, I will, equals power. I will equals power. So one of the first schools I went to was near Johannesburg. And I'm wearing that shirt in homage to Nelson Mandela. It's his 100th birthday this year, one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world. Now, I'm speaking at schools that are stratified not by apartheid, apartheid, the legalized system of discrimination of the time invented by the Nationalist Party in 1948. I'm speaking in the new democratic South Africa. We became, South Africa became democratic in 1994. I'm from the old world. I'm a white dude from the old world. How I'm thinking is my message going to resonate amongst these young people? Culturally, a vast Grand Canyon divide between me and them. How's my message going to resonate with these poor kids where schools have holes in the ceiling and non-working toilets? How's my message going to resonate with kids that have never seen the ocean? They've never heard anything about surfing. So at this first school, I get a call from a TV station, China Global Television sta Station. They said to me, Sean, we have the biggest reach of any TV station in the world. We want to come and cover your event. I'm going... It's my first event. I don't know whether these kids are going to be so far away from this message and not going to be able to relate. So they came down and they covered it. Surfer Sean Thompson is one of South Africa's finest sporting heroes. Famous for his style of riding the tube section of the wave, Thompson won the International Professional Surfers World Championship in 1977. Considered one of the 10 greatest surfers of all time, he now inspires others to follow his paddle. In this underprivileged school in Katlehong on the east side of Johannesburg, Thompson shares with youngsters a simple strategy for confronting everyday challenges and making positive, life-changing decisions. It's so wonderful to be inspiring some young kid in Johannesburg or Durban or, or uh, Los Angeles, anywhere, just to know that you drop that little pebble in the water, and what's it done? It's created a wave. And that wave is going to go and touch lives. In 12 personal stories, Sean shares the power of I will, a code that carries him through life. While, yes, this little code that I wrote, 12 lines that I wrote so many years ago, was about surfing, it's like every line is a metaphor and can be interpreted in so many different ways. It's about how you can be a good person, how you can be a good human being, how you can make a difference in the world, how you can impact others. So I've been on this journey for 10 years now, since I lost my beautiful son, and surfing was this constant. Surfing helped get me back on the path to healing again. Many of these teenagers have barely seen a beach, but the code has resonated among them. I will achieve my goals. I will be better. I will dream big, and I will be who I want to be. I will arise and shine, and I will face my fears, and I will take charge of my life. Although all these youngsters were born after apartheid, many of them are still trapped by poverty. But the code is giving them courage to change their lives. In this country, I deprived the right of opportunities, and I will break that cycle of being deprived of opportunities, and I will create opportunity for myself. This book will give me the courage that I don't have. It, I think it will give me that power to do what I want to do and to believe in myself. Sean Thompson's The Code is about many things, faith, courage, creativity, determination. But above all, it's about promises we make to ourselves, about the future and to turn hope into action. Julie Shar, CGTN, Katlehong, South Africa.
I love that statement of that one young girl. The power to do what I want to do. And within purpose is great power. So I went across the country. This was a Hlanga school. This was the first black school in South Africa where Nelson Mandela voted in 1994 with these wonderful words, I've come to report, Mr. President, that South Africa is now free. One of the most touching schools I went to was a Kualika school in Amlazi. When I was a young guy surfing on the pro tour, making tons of money, the woman that worked for my mother's son, I met him while he was working in the garden, helping out around the house. He said, sure, my name is Ernest Bongani and Corsi. He said, I want to finish school, but I got no money. I said, I'll pay your way through school. It was nothing for me to do nothing. He finished school. I was traveling the world, starting companies, winning surf contests. I ran into him when I came back to South Africa. He said, Sean, I want to go to university. He said, I've got no money. I said, I'll pay your way through university. It was absolutely nothing for me to do. I went back to South Africa a few months ago, and Ernest contacts me. He said, Sean, I want to tell you what I've done with my life. He said, I'm a principal. I have two teaching degrees. I have two teaching credentials, and I'm responsible for 1,600 students, and I want you to come and speak at my school. And I went and spoke at his school. It was a wonderful moment. I spoke at some of the richest schools in the country. Certainly, you can see that even though race is not a factor in South Africa, there's still that stratification by, by, by people with, with, with large incomes and small incomes. Michael House, an iconic school in South Africa, pulled the whole code concept into their school curriculum and changed it slightly instead of I will to we will. Since Dithian's girls, I loved what they wrote, we will accept, we will dream, we will be kind. So we got this wave going of young people writing their codes and importantly sharing their codes. This is Elon Musk's alma mater. You can see what these young guys wrote. I will change the world. I will be a conqueror. You wonder where he gets the juice and the mojo and the power and the purpose from. It comes from that school. And one exceptionally uh, uh, warm moment for me was at this school. You can see that young girl in the far right-hand side. I spoke to a couple of thousand students, and after I spoke to them, I said, who wants to share one line? Who wants to share one line of code? Who's got the power and the courage to come up and share in front of your classmates one line of code? And in South Africa, the girls graduate much uh, earlier than the guys. The girls are smaller. The guys are big, these big dudes. And uh, she steps out, and she walks up. She comes up to the front of the stage. She's this big. She's got to be the smallest girl on the whole stage. And I've got a microphone underneath her, and she stands and looks at the audience, looks at everyone, and goes like this. I will be a strong black woman! And the crowd goes crazy. She shows everyone her power and her purpose, and fundamentally creates that wave that rolls through her school. I went and met uh, with the Chief Albert Latuli, the first black man to win a Nobel Peace Prize. His daughter welcomed me to their uh, museum uh, to thank me for, for what I was doing with the kids. Kids, yeah, this works cool with kids, but it seems so juvenile. It was started with kids. I work with kids. How can it work for you? How can it work in the context of your organizations? How can it work in the context of profit, sales, and growth? Is there a place in there for purpose? Can purpose make an impact on athletes? So I thought I'm an experiment. One athlete. Yes, I've got a big sample size, one athlete. I see this young, this young Hawaiian surfer who cannot get past 25th place in events, surfing on the World Professional Tour. 25th, 25th, 25th. I write to him, hey, Zeke, write 12 lines, every line beginning with I will. This exercise is called writing your code, and it's the ultimate map for your life tomorrow. It is the way for a warrior. Zeke sends me his code. One week later, he goes from 25th to 3rd, and later in the year, he wins the world's biggest surf contest and writes me a letter. Sean, you helped me focus. You helped me by my power. Now I do the same thing with organizations. Of course, you recognize some of those logos. Some of the biggest organizations in the world, I come and speak about power, and I come and speak about purpose. Purposelessness 
is a fundamental problem in every single business today. In fact, on a recent Gallup poll, two-thirds of American employees are purposeless Two-thirds of employees in the United States are bored, detached, or jaded, and ready to sabotage plans, projects, and other people. From Gallup, in the Harvard Business Review. You look up the latest Harvard Business Review, how to turn purpose into performance. Purpose is at the forefront of the biggest companies in the world right now. And this was from the author of the study, The Business Case for Purpose. Around the world, the business environment is in a permanent state of disruption. Today, more than ever, companies are searching for a new genetic code that will help them continuously evolve to survive and to thrive. So my code is really simple. How to activate the power of purpose. And I want to tell you about the process. And because it's open source code, you can take the same process back to your families, back to your organizations, back to your teams, and use it. It's quite simple. It has two parts. Tell some emotional stories about struggle. Tell some emotional stories about honor and integrity. Then get everyone into a group, maximum of 40 people. Everyone writes their code, 12 lines. Every line begins with I will. It's a 30-minute process. Everyone sits together, writes their code, and then one at a time, people stand up and they read their code to one another. They read their 12 lines. I will have faith. I will pray. I don't know what the codes are, but everyone writes poetry. Everyone writes power. Everyone writes passion. So it's a simple, simple process. Write the code. Read the code aloud. And then everyone picks one line which is most resonant to them. And we write that line up on a board. And what a lot of companies do after this process, they'll create a graphic and they'll put it up right in the entrance hall so employees can see it, so suppliers can see it, so creditors can see it, so everyone that walks past can see what the company is all about. I will be authentic. I will choose to laugh first. I will be a great father. Yes, my company has purpose. No. Your employees, your team members have the purpose that gives the company the purpose. This was an interesting company, one of the hottest growing data companies on the West Coast. We called it an inside out code. Their business is code and the CEO wrote the 60 most important lines of code our company has ever written. I will prioritize relationships. I will make a living by giving to those in need. I will alter my course. Every line up there is something beautiful. This was a quarter of a billion dollar cosmetics company I will live life to the fullest. I will never shy away from a challenge. And this was the faculty at Claremont Graduate University, one of the super cool university on the West Coast. I will create, transforming what I already have into what can be. I will remember what I'm worth. I will have faith. So what is behind this process? Yes, people get in touch with their best self, but they tell everyone who they are and what they are going to be. And within that Statement of power, commitment, and purpose comes a deep level of emotional engagement. Why is emotional engagement important? Because disengagement is one of the most important problems facing business today. So this is a simple process to get engaged. So you can see, this is a simple way to define your purpose. 12 lines. Every line begins with, I will. And what I've found over the period that I've been doing it is that there are five elements to purpose. And there's a little acronym I came up with. I'm not such an acronym guy, but aim at. Aspirational. Inspirational. Moral. Authentic. And the counter opposite of a smart goal being timely, they are timeless. And these seem to be the elements of the code and the elements of purpose. Simple, five elements, aspirational, inspirational, moral, authentic, and purpose. And one of the things I do with, uh, with young people, after I've spoken to them and told them about how to find the internal power, how to find their purpose, I say, I will, equals power. I will 
equals power. I will equals power. And it's wonderful to hear the audience connect with the simple concept because in simplicity also is great power. So I know I've gone over time, but I want to tell you one more story about connectivity. Okay? So where I live in Santa Barbara, they call it, the, 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 there's a legend that we live under a rainbow bridge that Hutash, the earth mother of the Shumash Native American tribe that lived in this area, created a magic bridge for her people because they were starving. And they asked her for more food. She said, we're not going to give you more food. They all lived on this island that's about 24 miles south of the mainland. And she said, I'll create a magic bridge so you can cross this magic bridge for a new life. So the people crossed the magic bridge. And when they started to cross, some of them got dizzy. And she told them, don't look down. So they looked down and they fell and they started to drown in the water. So rather than have her people die, she changed them all into dolphins. So this whole area, when I surf out there and I surf out there regularly, it's filled with these dolphins that are the ancestors of uh, the Shumash people. And right near where the sacred rainbow has come down is my local beach that's about half a mile away from my home. It's called Hammond's Reef. You can see it's a beautiful beach. It's a spot of seclusion in a very busy world. And my late son and I used to love to surf at this particular wave together. We'd paddle out together. We'd wait for a wave together. He'd throw his arm around me. And it was just an incredible moment of bonding between father and son. And on this one particular day, we went to the beach to go surfing. He said to me, Dada, there's no surf today. Let's go and check the memorial. So right on the beach at Hammond's Reef is a beautiful meadow. And there's a beautiful memorial right in the middle of this meadow. And the memorial is dedicated to the Shumash people. You can see the, 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 the two dolphins up there with a beautiful inscription. The sacredness of the land lies in the mind of its people. This land is dedicated to the spirit and memory of the ancestors and their children. So my son said, Dad, let's go to the memorial. Let's leave an offering. We ran up to the memorial, and you leave an offering. You leave a shell. You leave a stone. You leave a feather. And then he ran down to the beach, down the little path, and he said, Dada, help me do this. And he picked up cobblestones that were on the beach, and he arranged them in a large circle. And I went along with my nine-year-old son, just the two of us on this beautiful beach together. And he said, Dada, keep going. And we arranged another circle of cobblestones. And then we arranged a third circle inside the sand, just the two of us. I'm playing along with my 10-year-old son. And in the innermost circle, he laid down two large rocks and ran down the beach and got a stick and put some kelp and feathers in the stick, and ran back to me and showed off his creation. Dada, we have a sacred story circle. And this is a sacred story stick. And the two of us are going to sit inside that sacred story circle, and we're going to tell each other stories. He said, but there's one rule. Whoever's got the stick tells a story. Whoever hasn't got the stick keeps quiet. Wow, my 10-year-old has developed perfect a mode of perfect communication. So my son and I sat inside the sacred story circle, and we passed the stick back and forth, back and forth, and we told each other stories. And out of all the times I've surfed on the biggest waves in the world, won the biggest surf contests in the world, this was the best moment for me, sharing my spirit, sharing my love, sharing my passion with my beautiful, beautiful son, passing that stick back and forth, back and forth. And I spoke at a school a couple of years ago in the island of Hawaii. It's the most, uh, it's actually, in fact, the wealthiest school in the world. It's called Kamehameha School. And it's a repository for Hawaiian heritage and culture. And I spoke to thousands of, of students. And after I spoke in their chapel, the chaplain came up to me and said, Sean, you and your son, you spoke in spirit language. You spoke in the language of the spirit. And that's what we did. We spoke to each other at a deeply emotional level, passing that stick back and forth. And I tell you this story because this is a story of connectivity. This is a story of emotional engagement. This story is, is a reflection of what can happen to you when you get together in a group and you write and share your code. Deep emotional engagement. So this beautiful time on the beach came to an end with my uh, wonderful son. We drove up the hill home about half a mile away from home. And I came to the front door and I put my key in the lock. I've got a big yellow door in Montecito in California. And my son pulled out of his pocket a stone. I said, Matthew, what's that? He said, Dada, 
This is a sacred story stone from a sacred story circle. And you know all the stories we told today? They're inside this stone. And he put the stone outside my front door. And if any of you ever come and visit me in 214 Middle Road, Montecito, California, you'll see the big yellow door and you'll see the sacred story stone. And whenever I walk into my door, I see the sacred story stone. And I feel those stories. I feel the power. I feel the passion. I feel the love. I feel, I feel, I feel it. So I'm hoping that everyone today felt my spirit, understood my spirit language, understood the importance of connectivity, understood the power, the power in purpose, and understood the power in those two words, I will, that I've seen across campus. I will equals power. I will equals power. So I'm not letting you all off. There's a call to action. Write your code. I will. 12 lines. Share your code. Write your code. Share your code. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.